What's up, y'all? I'm Renee Montgomery. I'm a former WNBA basketball player here in the U.S. And this is a story of a sportswoman I can't believe I've never heard of, Aura Washington. Like me, she played basketball. She also played tennis and won everything she could. But because she was black, she never got to play in the biggest tournaments. And untold legends, I'm going to give Aura her place in the history books at last. So let's go. Before we start, please note, this program contains some outdated language that may offend. There's a moment in every big game where you can feel the audience begin to lean in. Deuce! Go on, Miss Washington. You got her? Come on, Izzy! Quiet, please. In a match like this, one skill any champion of sport needs is the ability to block out the noise and focus. Tune into your training, your preparation, your instincts, and play. Advantage, Miss Channels. So, we're here in the stands at the 1925 New York State Tennis Tournament here in beautiful Harlem, the cultural heart of Black America the home of band leader Duke Ellington, poet Langston Hughes, and author Zora Neale Hurston. And this is the final set of the first round of the women's singles. It's August, brutally hot. Only black players competing, of course. Tennis, like nearly all sport in America at this time, is strictly segregated. And it's packed people in their finest for this event, a social occasion. So many hats, you can hardly see the net. Tennis is a sport Harlem wants to look good for. And something a little strange is happening on the court. Here's how it might've happened. Over there to our left is the clear favorite, Isadora Izzy Channels of Chicago, one of the greats of the game right now tall, powerfully built, in her prime at 25 years old, feared for her mean backhand and brutal cross-court drives. Just like that one. She's the winner of the Black National Women's title of 1922, among other trophies, not to be messed with. Deuce! You got this, Aura! And to our right, a newcomer, slightly older than Izzy, an upstart a certain Miss Aura Washington of Philadelphia. She's come a long way since her first lesson at the YWCA a few years ago. That's her trademark grip on the racket, nearly halfway up the handle. Nice serve. Advantage, Miss Washington. So, this match should have been just easy plain sailing for Izzy as the favorite. And you know what? It started out that way. Aura lost the first set, but then something switched. Aura won the second. And now, suddenly, on this hot August day, this is looking like a very dangerous moment for Izzy. And for Aura, a win here would be a breakthrough to the black tennis elite. An announcement of a major new talent on the scene. If, if our girl can find victory, here in Harlem. And that's why it's become a question of focus, of resolve. This is what the crowd loves, of course, when a David meets a Goliath. This is the third and final set, the decider. Advantage, Miss Washington. From BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service, this is Untold Legends Aura. I'm Renee Montgomery, former pro basketball player, now co-owner of the Atlanta Dream women's basketball team. Episode 3, Advantage Aura. I've been in that moment. I've been in the moment where it's almost 
silence, that lean in moment where the fans are waiting for it. They want it. They need it. They know that something's about to happen. And it gives me chills even thinking about it. It's the athlete in me. But there's that feeling that if you can actually deliver to the crowd what the crowd wants and then everything erupts, there's no better feeling in sports. Advantage, Miss Washington. Even if you are David going against Goliath and you know the fans are now behind you, everybody wants to give the fans what they want. You want to do that. You want to give the fans what they want. I want to introduce you to someone who's kind of a legend, Art Carrington, author, historian, and one of the great Black tennis players of the 60s and 70s. Art started young. Well, when I first encountered tennis, I didn't even know the name tennis. My mother had a tennis racket in the house, and so, you know, we lived where I could hit on a wall. He's talking about a childhood in New Jersey in the 1950s, not the kind of place where it's easy for Black people to get access to tennis classes. We lived in a public housing complex at the time, so I could go out. So when I was six, seven years old, I'd go out and hit against the wall, but I didn't know there was a game called tennis. But there was one place which could offer a talented youngster a racket and some guidance. And then when we moved, we lived in a neighborhood where it was just two courts and a small black tennis club. And that's where I first saw tennis being played and black people enjoying hitting this ball. Ars retired as a tennis player now, but looks 20 years younger than his age. You wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of his serve. And his first childhood experiences with tennis took place at a time when sport in America was still officially segregated by race. The small black tennis club that he joined, places like that nurtured talent that would never get a look in at white clubs in those days, just like Aura getting her tennis classes at the YWCA in Philly. But those clubs and the YWCAs provided more than just lessons in a practice space. They offered a community. Black tennis came from a social world because the feature was always the camaraderie and the players coming from around the country. And it was a beautiful thing. In case it isn't obvious, you don't get players of arts caliber without a whole culture behind them. The same culture that also nurtured Aura a couple of generations earlier. During Aura's time, that culture had to fight to survive and be seen. A game like tennis wasn't seen as fit for Black people. And at the heart of that culture was an organization that tried to link together all the local small clubs and venues, the American Tennis Association, the ATA, a Black national tennis organization built and designed for us. The ATA was a community. The history of the ATA originally was founded for the Black intelligentsia to have a method of recreating in a healthy way because everywhere was shut down. Arts documented the lives of earlier Black champions, including Aura, trying to understand the obstacles they experienced in proving themselves as athletes and the culture that supported them. And he says that for Aura to reach that Harlem tennis court in 1925, that already required decades of work by groups like the ATA and its forerunners. So first of all, in 1898, these brothers came together in Philadelphia and they had what they called the inter-club competition. And it was mainly Black professionals from Boston to D.C. Wherever tennis was big with white America, it was big with Black also. So you look at Philly, where all Washington came from. The segregation created an atmosphere that caused us to come together and join together. And so that's what really made the ATA great. One of the key responses to segregation, to exclusion in America is, if they won't let us in, we'll build our own particularly when it comes to supposedly high-class, elite culture. You know, like tennis. The ATA was that Black alternative in tennis, an arena to shine in. Very few people knew about the ATA and what a role it played in Black communities in Chicago and Philadelphia and New York and Boston, up and down the East Coast and New Orleans. And this culture was always about more than just rackets and nets. Think of Miss Yancey, the fitness instructor at the Y, encouraging Aura to take up tennis to help deal with a family tragedy. ATA as a place where Black people could come together as a support system to support one another and just be in community with each other. 
And at the time when Aura is playing, more and more black people are in need of this support system. People like Aura who have left their old lives in the South and are trying to make new lives in the Northern cities. Tennis as a response to the Great Migration. When we migrated north, opportunity was very limited recreationally. So I think that tennis was the first real recreation. So that culture of Black tennis, from the YWCA to the ATA, might explain some of why Aura seeks out tennis and how she finds a place to develop her talent and excel. But of course, she isn't only facing the obstacles of a racially segregated society. She's doing so as a woman in the 1920s. Here's historian Rita Liberti. Sport, beginning in the 19th century, is so attached to manhood and masculinity that when women entered it, they were often cast aside or ignored or seen as mannish. Have things changed that much? Think about how social media treats Serena Williams even now, describing her as manly or masculine. In the early 20th century, women certainly more in mass begin to challenge those perceptions. And I think that's a part of them gaining access to the public sphere. And so I think there's women pushing to be much more a part of sport and physical recreation in the early 20th century. And that certainly goes across classes of people. And the American Tennis Association functioned as a tool for that social mobility. ATA events were for those who were enjoying their own success. Black people who had made it or intended to make it. In 1927 at Hampton, they were proud that they had 600 cars. In New Jersey, they had 1,000 cars from 1925. Owning a car in 1925, that wasn't something most Black families could boast of. And so they had a fashion show, how people were dressed. It was not only the tennis, but around the tennis. And you know everyone would be talking about who wore what and who wore it best. A place to be seen. They would be cookouts and events at prestigious Black homes. So these brothers that owned the theaters in Chicago and Philadelphia, they were very wealthy men. And if you weren't part of the Black elite yet, you could always fake it until you make it, too. Art remembers his own first time at an ATA event. Always people know where you're from. My father was a construction laborer. They would say that I, my father was a doctor. So I realized that people thought because I was good in tennis, they associated a whole socioeconomic thing with me. I could see then that tennis could move me. Is that what Aura was thinking too? That this is a game that could move her? We don't have Aura's own account of why she became an athlete, why she decided to devote herself to mastering and competing in this sport on top of her paying job as a domestic servant. But if you were a former farm girl from Virginia, one of eight children, maybe it might cross your mind. And it might cross your mind when you hear about a great Black female champion from the South, Isadora Izzy Channels, the same woman Aura's playing in that match in 1925 in Harlem. To the modern audience... This is the, our channels in the 20s was equivalent to the Serena Williams of today. Robert Pruta is one of America's finest sport historians, and he's made it his project to rediscover Isadora's story. When Isadora Channels emerged in the 20s, she was the first huge African-American female sports star in tennis. And these sports stars was a reaffirmation to the African-American community that they were not second-class citizens. They could be just as good in the sports as the mainstream society, the white society, if you will. More than just a great player, a symbol of what we now call Black excellence. In the early 20s, she just dominated tennis. I mean, and he, she dominated so, so much Uh, Nobody was really even in second place. She was a much stronger, much more athletic female tennis player that African-Americans had ever seen before. And so the assumption was that she could continue to win forever. So when Aura is coming up, 
taking her first tennis classes, then entering her first competitions, is Isadora, who was the reigning champion of Black women's tennis, filling the sports pages of the Black press, an inspiration, maybe even a role model. And Izzy is a unique talent. When you ask Robert to describe her game, it's like he was there on the court watching her just last week. Her serves are much more powerful than Aura would generally meet. And she was very fast on the court. And she just strongly hit the ball. And so she would be like the Williams sisters. Just like Aura, no one in the media thought to ask Isadora much about herself, her thoughts, or her life story. Like Aura, what we do have are her match reports, a list of victories, evidence of pure domination on the court. And there were other parallels. They're both close in age. Izzy is probably a couple years younger than Aura. Both were born in the rural Jim Crow South. Here's what else Robert has been able to dig up about Izzy. She came from a very poor family from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Her father was illiterate and was not in her life. The mother and father divorced, and she was living with her mother. She was really dirt poor, as they say. Just like Aura, definitely not part of the middle-class Black elite of Harlem, not part of the world of tennis galas and fashion shows that Art Carrington experienced. And like Aura, young Izzy Channels decides to leave the South and strike out for a new life in the big cities of the North. She doesn't choose Philadelphia, though. She arrives in Chicago. A few years later, she's working as what's called a packer in the Chicago dockyards, moving goods on and off ships, hard industrial physical work. But she too finds time to start a new hobby, tennis. Not what some people expected of Black women at the time. Black women were moving in this space, and what I started noticing was that these Black women all were coming from rural areas. Dr. Amira Rose Davis has also studied the lives of both players. And so here you have these Black women who are all moving in the early 20th century from rural spaces into cities where they have the opportunity to play tennis at these emerging tennis clubs. It turns out Chicago has its own thriving Black women's tennis culture, just like Aura finds at the Y. In Chicago, it's led by a giant of the previous generation, the legendary Mary Ann Mother Seams. In Chicago, Izzy Channels was able to train at a Black-owned tennis court because Mother Seams ran a Black-owned tennis court in Chicago. So Izzy's experience with tennis was in an insulated space of opportunity. Insulated because, like the Y in Philadelphia, Mother Seams Tennis School provides a safe space for Black women from any background to thrive. Maybe that explains why both young women sought out this experience in addition to their day jobs. With Izzy Channels and with Aura Washington, you can see how Black class politics factored in. Their work still made them kind of on the margins of being Black middle class. Here's Robert on Izzy again. In other words, she raised her social level by participating in the sport. And this happened to so many African-Americans. Well, you look at the NBA today, you look at the backgrounds of some of the players. They're millionaires, but they grew up in a family with an empty refrigerator. From what we can tell, Mother Seams ran a tight ship. If you chose to train at her court, you were expected to take things extremely serious. According to one source, she warned her young ladies that tennis was a form of beneficial exercise, far superior to dancing to Charleston. And it's on Mother Seam's watch that Izzy, the champion, emerges. Women's Championship goes to Miss Channels, Chicago Defender, July 21st, 1920. Miss Channels would hold her own with the best tournament players of the world. Chicago Defender, April 19th. 1924. Miss Isidore, with her mean backhand and her cross-court drives, her ability to play the net as well as the backcourt makes her the strongest contender for the national honors. Chicago Defender, August 11th, 1923. 
So for all these reasons, I've got to think that Aura must have had Izzy in mind as she first begins training seriously. If Aura is to use tennis as a stepping stone to a better life, to the world of the ATA, Izzy is the type of opponent she needs to be ready to face. And on that afternoon, on a summer's day in Harlem in 1925, that's what happens for the first time. Izzy, ruling women's champion, Chicago's finest, Mother Seems' disciple, Aura, newcomer from Philly, final set of the first round. Not an ATA championship, but a similar crowd and competitors. We've got a good view of the court from up here. Come on, Aura! Quiet, please. Like I said, a David versus Goliath situation developing right in front of us. What should have been a trouble-free walk to the finals for Isadora is proving kind of interesting. It's still the third and final set, and it's like the last two. It's very tight. The score right now is 5-4 to Aura, but it's advantage Izzy. Aura is serving. This could still go either way. Advantage, Miss Washington. And there it is, in front of us, over there. You can see Aura walking slowly to her chair by the umpire, sitting, holding her head in her hands, the racket falling by her side. That's the shot. It's over. Mrs. Isadora Channels beaten in first round by Aura Washington of Philadelphia, New York age, August 22nd, 1925. The great Isadora Channels makes way before the almost unknown Aura Washington. Down on the court, Izzy isn't showing any emotion on her face, but it's in her walk away from the net. Fans witness big upset when Chicago star is outclassed. Miss Isadora Channels of Chicago, twice national champion, was defeated by Miss Aura Washington of Philadelphia. Well, it meant that the reigning female star of African American tennis was beaten. It was a huge upset. The mighty will fall eventually. <laughs> Every successful athlete has this moment. The moment when you realize that this game might actually be about to change your life, that you might make it, that this could be your ticket to a different future. 1925, champion, New York State Tennis Association, women's singles, Aura Washington. And Aura isn't going to stop with the first win against Isadora. This is where her time at the top in tennis begins. 1925 women's doubles, ATA national title, Aura Washington. 1926 women's doubles, ATA national title, Aura Washington. And here's where Aura's story gets kind of crazy, when she moves from being a successful athlete to a once in a generation talent. When Aura starts winning tennis trophies, she just doesn't stop. In 1925, the same year as her defeat of Isadora Channels, Aura wins her first tennis ATA doubles title. She goes on to win that title every single year until 1936. That's more than a decade of uninterrupted victories as a doubles player. And in singles tennis, the even more prestigious category, same kind of story. It takes a few more years for her to reach the top, but when she breaks through, she stays there. She wins the Women's ATA Singles Trophy every year from 1929 to 1935. Seven unbroken years as a champion at the top. And along the way, there were other numerous trophies, prizes, and championships. Later in life, Aura herself said she had 155 trophies to her name. It must have taken her a while just to count them up. Here's Rita Liberti of Cal State University, part of the Aura Squad. She was extraordinary on the court, I think, and just, she was a headliner everywhere. 
you know. And I mean, you, it's hard not to read the black press across the 1930s sports pages and not see Ora Washington's name come up again and again and again. She might be a headliner, dominating black sports media, but this is not a Naomi Osaka or Williams sister moment. This isn't the start of global superstardom, magazine covers, merchandising, or even endorsement deals from international sportswear brands. This is still pre-war America, and sometimes simply being the very best at your game still isn't good enough. First of all, All tennis competitions are amateur, so no cash prizes. And endorsement deals and advertising? Not an option for someone like Aura. Outside the Black press, Black women are invisible in advertising. So Aura is a star, but is she rewarded for that achievement? Nope. It's kind of heartbreaking, but we have this entry recorded in the U.S. Census for 1930, five years after Orr's victory over Izzy Channels. 15th Census of the United States. Washington, Aura, Lodger. Sex, female. Color or race, Negro. Age, 33. Employment, maid. Industry, hotel. That's right. Our Aura is a hotel maid. Superstar Aura Washington. And by the way, the census man got her age wrong again. The census of that year also records whether a citizen owns a radio set, a sign of wealth in 1930s America. Aura does not. So far as we can tell, Aura never does give up the day job as a maid or servant or housekeeper. And Isadora Channels keeps working too. But you know what? We're getting ahead of ourselves. In the mid-20s, Aura's star is rising. She's adored by the black press and celebrated in Philly. And her rivalry with Izzy is growing. And then Aura does what no manager would recommend today. Follows a completely new, untested path. A handbrake turn. Something that brings her closer to my own life. A different sport. And a different kind of court. Aura was the kind of player who would elevate the play of those of her teammates. She was the Michael Jordan of women's basketball. Untold Legends is a Stance Studios production for BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service. And I'm your host, Brene Montgomery. Our cast were Cameron Williams, Joy Vandervoort Cobb, Serena Grace, Allison Brown, and Ken Foster. Before you go, I want you to be a part of our Aura squad. We're searching for even more information about Aura. Maybe you know somebody who met Aura, or maybe you know something, anything, that would help us further piece together her life story. Tell us. You can get in touch by visiting bbcworldservice.com slash untoldlegends. <laughs>